And you also did a podcast on this recently that was, I think it was a one of your talks that you gave. And you gave some suggestions for um, walking more as a family that was really, they were really helpful for me because they were just sort of new creative ways of thinking about family walks, especially as my kids are a little bit older. So this is related to clothing, but um, can we just pause on the family walk or walking more and how we can build more of that into our life? Some of the creative ideas and suggestions you have around that? Well, walking's so great. I mean, so nutritionally, I would say if we, if we have a, if you think about the food pyramid, um, the, the, the dietary food pyramid, the government food pyramid, it's organized by the things that you need more than others nutritionally. And so if you have that in mind, I've put walking at our movement nutrition base. It, it is really, it's a foundational movement. It meets a lot of needs, not only the fact that it moves so many different body parts, um, and that it also moves the whole body well, moves your whole person from point A to point B. It also fits into many scenarios. It can be used as more than just going to take a walk. It could be used for transportation. It could be used to facilitate other things that you're trying to do. So walking is, it's a really critical skill. You know, disabilities aside where you aren't able to walk, um, it, it falls into that category in many times of labor that we were talking about. You know, really the fact of getting your body from point A to point B is something that we don't do anymore, but everyone before us did a very large amount of, and it's rapidly disappearing. And the culture, our greater culture is so car centric. The places where walking is even possible is, is dwindling. And then again, our perceptions about what kids can do as far as walking is like, oh, like, I mean, it's a mile. I don't think my kids could walk a mile, right? Which is, has more to do with skill set and practice than physical capability. Kids can walk much farther than you think you can. They, they can. So um, yeah, so that talk was 10 ways to get kids moving more because it is such a, it's a good family connection time. And I'm a big fan of taking movement and inserting it into you getting other things done. So just for kids who are a little bit older, like ours are now, I think our kids maybe are on the same age, maybe mine are a little bit older, but homework, um, you know, memorizing spelling words and doing spelling tests and memorizing play lines and um, doing mental math. Um, and all those, it's such a great opportunity for when a kid gets done at the end of the day and does not need to be spending any more time sitting down. It's the worst thing to do to your kid. They've been sitting in school all day and then make them come home and sit and do homework. Inside and sit inside. It's like, and, and then inside, yeah. and you have, there's no like real family space or yeah. connection time. Like the fact that you can go out and take a walk and put all the things that you're talking about that, that walking and movement does, put all that better memory, better creativity. Um, and kids are such good. They're good at doing multiple things at once or Maybe like I've just seen it in my kids who are, who are good at fidgeting. Like I have a I have a son who really has a big need for lots of fidgeting kind of movement, and to sit down is really torture for him, as he would say it. But man, he gets something underfoot and he's balancing. He'll rattle off the math. He has no problem. You just have to put in that movement. And then of course birds are singing. You get sort of the you get the benefit of doing maybe the unschool homeschool thing where when you when you move out of your space learning opportunities are all around you you spot them you do not have to go to nature school but going out in nature on a family walk becomes a DIY nature school so it's so I like it for that reason um, I like it for celebratory reasons you know we do a lot of celebration on foot we do a lot of friend time community mm -hmm. time um out on foot, not always walking, you know, sometimes we'll like our soup and sports night is a really big thing that gets us through winter when we tend to want to go inside and not move as much and not be in outside in nature as much, not be with our friends as much outside of, you know, parties. I'm talking like really low tech, not fancy, bring a pot of soup to a park and a Frisbee and a football makeup games. There's creativity. It brings back that play. All of that can really happen um, on a walk. And so, yeah, I'm a big fan of starting as soon as your children can walk, make, make it a must. That was one of the tips because I, I think that we let movement off the hook. We don't let homework off the hook. We don't let dental hygiene off the hook. Um, we don't let eating off the hook, but we will let movement off the hook every time because we really culturally collectively, um, are failing to see its value. And so therefore we don't maintain its place.
I loved how you said in that episode, you talked about expecting the wine oh, and yeah. moving through the wine. Right. And I think that's the case for when we're working with kids, they're going to they're gonna whine the first, you know, and then they kind of get over it. Right. But then also we, we might whine if we're taking ourselves for a walk. Like we can even expect ourselves to whine. Like, I don't want to, I'm too tired. I kind of, it's like easier just to relax in my home and it's, it's too much effort, but we can expect the wine from ourselves. We can expect the wine from our children and you just move through it. And then what happens is this, like there's this shift in momentum where it's like, you can't, you succumb to the walk because it starts feeling good. <laughs> you can't, yeah. you can't deny it. Like you just start to feel better. You start to get a, a broader perspective, all that blood flow to your brain um, and the connection to nature. There's um, little things that I think that are that are better for your mental health and um, especially at the end of the day than going for a walk. And one of the, the tip you said at the end of your episode to take one away, the one that you're going to take away and the one that I loved from you was the one way walk, like have a parent oh, be best. at one side and drop the car and you're and the parent that needs more exercise gets to like sprint back or jog back or whatever to the family as the family just walks one way to get to the destination. And then there's no turning around. It's just sort of like you're going somewhere, whether it's the ice cream shop or the um, library or whatever it is, getting there um, is is really the goal, which I think evolutionarily fits our walking needs. We're not meant to walk in circles. We're meant to walk to go to something. <laughs> yeah. It, and and that really, that changed everything, especially when we had really young children. Like we would, for our evening activity, we'd be out for, you know, two and a half hours, three hours. I would pack up dinner. You know, don't feel compelled to have to eat all of your meals sitting down in your house. I mean, yeah. they're portable. Food is portable. Humans have always eaten on the move. Um, but it was a really, it was a nice respite time, especially for um, parents or elo parents who don't have a lot of time with their children because they're working all day, that's always a nice trade-off. You know, maybe the one who just got home from being away could take the lead on moving the children forward. And the person who has been all the time can still enjoy that family time, you know, that time of connecting with everybody that wants to be involved, but can have a little alone time, a little, a little chance to take a breath. And that was, that was a huge, um, lifesaver for us, our evening dinner, one-way walks. Um, yeah, I wanted to share it because I hope more people will be able to use it, especially as the that. lights are longer and, um, and you know, people are still negotiating their, you know, nine to five or whatever hours. I mean, that nine to five more metaphorically, like that hunk of time where you're away and you want to more, you want to move outside with your family on, on yeah. a weekday, not save it up for a weekend, not have to be on a vacation where you don't feel like it's a regular part of your life. Like make it part of your regular life, like dinner. You eat dinner every day, even if it's not as fancy as what you eat on vacation or your favorite foods, get it in there every day. Yeah. So that that brings us to another container, which is probably my favorite container for movement, which is eating and food and how much it's just phenomenal when you start to take a look at how much of our food and our eating has been outsourced. Um, Everything from, you know, not growing our food anymore to even just not making our food or just these subtle ways in which we're we're kind of not making our food. So we're not, you know, whipping things or we're not chopping things. We're not grinding things and the packaging of things. And that's something that has brought so much richness to my family life and my my partnership with my with my husband is making food together and mm-hmm. it's it's just culturally i think it's part of our heritage it's part of our ancestry and it's getting lost and in it is also getting lost sort of these fine motor skills and these digging and these reaching all these other movements as well yeah i mean that's my favorite chapter um the food container, because because when you look at why humans move, getting food is the number one reason. You know, um, it's it's the primary. And this was I brought this up in uh, movie or DNA. It's like the relationship between moving and eating is direct. With really movement being first. Like you wake up, and you're the only reason you really do need to move is because there's something out there that you need to get. And we've just gotten rid of the need. So it's. You can talk about all the ways we get food from the, on the first level, growing it, you know, having a garden or, or foraging it, you know, you know, it is not always agricultural base, but, but then, um, 
there's just been, again, that steady decline that we talked about where food has just become both hyper palatable in the dietary nutrition sense, but also hyper palatable in the movement sense where it's all just like hitting some simple pleasure button, no work required. I mean, and, and with the pandemic, well, people, you know, were swiping more for their food, including even the groceries. People weren't even walking into the store to get the groceries that were grown someplace else. So we've had another steadily de steady decline just here again, a big jump. And mm -hmm. um, it's rich. It's celebratory. It's knowledge. It's learning. It's all of the things, you know, again, um, food and movement are the axis for culture, um, right? Like we don't, we, I mean, we have a very strong food culture. It just looks like what ours looks like, which is much different than all the other very strong food movement cultural axes that were about what was going on in nature and the natural rhythms, you know, the, the cyclicness, cycl the cyclicness of food and what comes and when, and your knowledge of just the environment or landscape that you are in. So when you go towards making your own food, it doesn't have to be all the way to that axis of like what's in season, you know, like what you, you're harvesting apples and oranges and nuts and you start to learn what those rhythms are. But could, it could be as simple as picking out an old family recipe and just doing the work from scratch to make that recipe. It doesn't have to be about in season or even have the nature connection. It can have a familial or uh, your own particular culture, your heritage, heritage of where you come from, it can be a great thing to bring into your family. And then, um, yeah, we'll talk about celebrations when we get to the celebration container. But I find that that's a really great way to center all celebrations is around yeah. what are we eating for it? What I've sort of done is just started to look at all these little contraptions that I have in my house to mm -hmm. outsource movement. And trying to not use them as much. So everything from like a nutcracker when my kids were toddlers, the best activity, if you want like an hour of time is give them a, a pile of walnuts and two rocks <laughs> and they'll sit there oh, yeah. and crack the nut and then eat the walnut out and then crack. And it's like, it's like a snack. It's a whatever. Cracking nuts is great. Um, fidget spinners, like having kids get some, we grow fava beans because it's helpful to the soil, to the, the nutrients of the soil. But the whole fava bean experience is a, is a fidget spinner, spinner because you have to like take the fava beans out of the pods and then each little fava bean has a little skin on it. So you have to take the little skin off. All these things that could just be a fun activity. You talk to your kid while you shell fava beans. I mean, it's at that level, I feel like it's family time, it's making food time, it's movement time. But what people will say is that takes too much time. And I <laughs> I will say maybe, yeah, it takes a lot of time. But at the end of that time, what I get from that is really deeply linked to my values, which is spending time with my family and moving my body and having a connection to nature as opposed to talking about the environment and reading about the environment. We're experiencing the environment. And that's great to do with um – older people too. I mean, like I grew up cracking nuts as a young child, like your young children are, but my parents weren't there doing it with me. All the elders of the community, that was their task to sort of do it with the younger children. And that's where they connected and they stayed physically active and were contributing to the food. You know, that was the motion that best suited them. And um, it's really beautiful to see that full ecology Mm -hmm. in practice of, of restoring some of those, those movements that are related to food. And again, the seasons is really great. Yeah. I want to pause on elders real quick before we go to celebrations, because you wrote dynamic aging. And as I am aging and as I'm watching my parents age, I have been thinking more and more about the importance of movement in, in um, healthy aging and just lifespan and health span. And my mom, my mom, when I were on a retreat in Costa Rica this past week, and we were um, going up and down these like stairs that were made out of rocks kind of carved into the jungle and she was climbing up them. And she was saying, you know, I was talking about how I was going to be talking with you. And she said, you know, 
the thing that I've really learned from Katie is I'm not holding, I'm not like leaning on handrails as much. I'm trying to see if my body can get up the stair without using the handrail to get up. Because here I, here she was, there were no handrails in Costa Rica. <laughs> she had no option and she was able to do it. Um, and she was able to, in the yoga class that we talked, t- that we took, lie on her back and reach her feet and grab a hold of her feet in like a happy baby pose. I looked over and I was like, oh, my mom could reach her feet. That's that's such a good sign that I've heard you talk about too. Like these things that actually mean something later on when you need to take care of your feet as you're aging and, and it can actually cause a lot of problems if you can't. So talk about just briefly around like aging and, and movement and how it links to just our, our health span in the long run. Our health span and I would say our, our range of experiences. To me, I think that that I just got, have you read Atul Gawande's uh, Being Mortal? Mm-hmm. I feel like it's a must read for every every yeah. human, certainly every American. Like I would put that out there because it's really about it's about what to expect as we get older in a way that is completely different than what I talk about. But those books really go to go together well, dynamic aging and being mortal. Because being mortal really shows you as you get older, what becomes important to you are your best days, you know, having your best days. And of course, as you get older, there's an inevitable decline that happens and you're going to have a decrease, especially if you have illness that comes up, but how to still have your best day no matter what. Um, And then have a team of people who understand and are working also towards your best day. But your best day often involves some physicality. And and there's a large portion of that book about gerontology, which I really liked when I was an undergraduate. I took a lot of gerontology classes because, because the things, and gerontology has sort of gone away as a field um, because, because there's nothing to gerontology except um, well, I don't want to say nothing for all the gerontologists are out there. The bulk of what's the bulk of what makes up gerontology is Here's how to take care of your body, keep it strong, eating well. It's the same things that we all need because we are all aging. We are all aging always. I mean, that's just what's happening to us. And this idea that oftentimes the physical decline that we experience as we get older is compounded by the fact that we are in a sedentary environment. It's not really only your age that is creating the physical experience that you're having. It's the, it's more, um, the length of habit that you've had of not using certain parts. And we just sort of make this transition. Like your mother was saying, Oh, there's a handrail. I'm going to use it for safety, which is great. But the idea of using it for balance versus training your arm to pull harder just also allows your legs to not have to maintain the strength. And then what happens when you are presented to go to a place that doesn't have handrails or the handrail is loose and then Mm -hmm. you depend on it and then you fall. And like a lot of injuries, like I study biomechanics, that's what I study. And how do falls, slips and trips occur is when you were operating in your environment and something unexpected happened that you couldn't deal with physically because our move, our range of capable, our range of movements in a younger, healthier person is already pretty low because our environment is so fixed and we move in it so in often. Um, and then you compound it by the fact that there are other changes that are happening. And then you are just, you're ripe for a situation that sets you on a path where movement rapidly declines. And so I just, I really, I mean, I'm passionate about movement, but if I were to target a group, it would be the dynamic agers, the goldeners, and the children. Like you can either start it super, super fresh, or you can start it right now if you feel like you're a dynamic ager and and you're gonna get um, a very big return on it because you're starting from a place of being more sedentary than you probably realize. Yeah, or just more doing the same thing over and over and over again. My dad, who's a competitive bicyclist, his body, is like in 70 something, he's still riding 67 miles, but his body looks like a bicycle. Sure. That's what happens. <laughs> or like on a bicycle. Yeah. He can't reach the back of his head to the ground. No, it doesn't have and a so balanced he, movement diet. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so it's like, how do we have more of that variety? 